Green College for our talk on uh, human evolution, culture, and cognition. Uh, we're very happy tonight to have uh, Dr. Jess Tracy from the Psychology Department here at UBC with us, and I'll, let me give her a brief introduction. Uh, so Jess uh, got her PhD at the University of California and uh, had a postdoc after that before coming before joining UBC as her first job. She's a, a Michael Smith Foundation Scholar for Health Research. And I was looking through her publications, and one of the things I noticed, one of the things I've learned since uh, moving to the uh, Department of Social and Personality Psychology is that the coveted journal is the Journal of Social and Personality Psychology. And Jess seems to be using that for her personal publication journal, and having it uh, three years in a row, 06, 07, 07 08, and 09. Uh, but then I guess she got tired, so now she's publishing just in the Proceedings of the National Academy. So she's got, she's got quite a record, and um, just from traveling around, I know Jess, despite her youth, is already recognized as the sort of the, the, the researcher on uh, uh, the, the emotion of pride. So uh, I'd like to introduce Jess now. Thanks, Jeff. Um, that was very nice. Thanks. And thanks uh, for inviting me here. Um, let's see. So usually I, I give a talk with my laptop right in front of me, but I'm sure this will be fine. I'll just scan over there and I'll be able to see the slides perfectly. <laughs> just kidding. Um, if I'm looking a lot at the screen, you'll know why. But, um, but yeah, so I'm going to be talking today about some of the research I've done on Pride. And um, I thought, given uh, the timing of this, that uh, I think tomorrow is the 150th anniversary of Darwin's Origin of the Species, I thought it would be appropriate to open my talk with, um, with Darwin. And a rather provocative claim that he made although not one that he made in The Origin of the Species, uh, one that he made that we'll be celebrating, I guess, 13 years from now, um, that he made in his 1872 book, The Expression of Emotion in Man and Animals. And in that book, Darwin observed that humans and animals showed very similar nonverbal expressions of emotion. And based on this observation, and of course being Darwin, he inferred that emotion expressions must be evolved. Now, this claim was very controversial at the time, and it really remained pretty controversial through, um, well, about the entire century that followed it. Um, now, of course, thanks to research conducted by Paul Ekman, Carol Lazard, and their colleagues in the 1960s and 70s, we know that these six emotions are associated with distinct, universally recognized, nonverbal expressions, providing support for Darwin's claim. Now, this research really created a major shift in the way that scientists viewed emotions. These six emotions were placed within a functionalist framework that led to research on their adaptive functions, their impact on cognition, um, their neurobiology, um, really kind of led to the boon of affective science that now exists in psychology. However, one uh, perhaps inadvertent outcome of this research is that in order to be considered, a number of scientists adopted the perspective, I should say, that in order to be considered a real emotion, that emotion was thought that it must have a distinct, universally recognized nonverbal expression. And I think looking at this slide, there's sort of an obvious problem with this perspective, which is that six is a very small number. Um, I think that most researchers, and certainly most people, would argue that there are many more than six real emotions. The emotions that I've spent most of my time studying, the self-conscious emotions, are conspicuously absent from that list. Um, so these are emotions like pride, shame, embarrassment, and guilt. Um, they were they're different from the six that I just showed you. They require complex self-evaluative processes. So in other words, you need to think about who am I and, and do I like who I am? Do I like myself in order to experience these emotions? For this reason, they have important connections to a range of um, other important topics in psychology, such as self-esteem, self-consciousness, and self-awareness. These emotions are clearly more cognitively complex than the six that I just showed you. However, there still may be a reason to think that they fit within a Darwinian framework. In fact, Darwin himself speculated that pride might have a distinct nonverbal expression, writing, a proud man exhibits the sense of superiority over others by holding his head and body erect. He makes himself appear as large as possible so that he is, he is said to be swollen or puffed up with pride. If we look at photos like this, this, it seems like Darwin may have been on the right track. <laughs> um, sorry. But what is pride? Well, according to emotion researcher Richard Lazarus, pride is a positive emotion that confirms or enhances social worth, which is to say the way others perceive the self. And as Mark Leary has shown in his sociometer theory, social worth is directly tied to our own sense of self-worth, our self-esteem. So if pride is the mechanism by which our social worth is confirmed and our self-esteem is enhanced, then this suggests that pride may in fact be adaptive. 
and specifically, it may function to promote social status. So um, Azim Sharif and Joey Chang and I recently wrote a theoretical paper in which we argued that pride is in fact an adaptation for securing social status. And we argued that this works in at least two distinct ways. So first, if an individual has a success and feels pride and then conveys those feelings to others through a recognizable nonverbal expression, others are going to know that this is a successful person who in fact deserves high status. At the same time, the individual's own pride experience is going to make her feel good about herself, boosting her self-esteem. And self-esteem, we know, functions to tell the individual that she deserves higher status. So this model of pride as sort of a mechanism for increased and sustained social status provides kind of a general framework that's guided a lot of my research and that guides the studies that I'll be telling you about today. Um, I want to start with telling you about some studies that uh, my collaborators and I did to address this side of the figure and basically try to answer Darwin's question, which is, is there a distinct pride expression which functions to promote social status? Now, when we began this research, there wasn't a whole lot that had been done on pride and um, really there wasn't any clear evidence whether or not there was a distinct pride expression. So we began simply by photographing people posing expressions that we thought might represent pride. Um, we had people pose lots of different configurations of expressions and we did a bunch of studies using different methods to test whether observers would reliably agree that this is in fact a pride expression. What we found across all these studies is that there is a distinct recognizable pride expression. The mean recognition rate that we get is comparable to what's typically found for the six basic emotions that I showed you before. And people don't have any problems distinguishing pride from similar emotions such as happiness or excitement. We also found that pride is best recognized when it includes this specific configuration of components. So a uh, slight head tilt back, small smile, ex expanded posture, and arms in one of these various configurations, basically the, the key is that arms need to be out from the body, making the individual look larger. So we found good recognition here. We call this akimbo um, with hands on hips, but also you get recognition if arms are raised or crossed on the chest. And just to briefly uh, pay homage to Darwin here, if you look at his quote on pride, this is kind of exactly what he said. So he said, holding head and body erect, that fits with our head tilt and expanded posture, uh, appear as large as possible, that fits with arms out from the body, and then again, swollen or puffed up, fits with expanded posture. So that's good. Um, OK, so having found that there is this distinct recognizable pride expression, we next wanted to know, well, how widely does it generalize? I mean, is this something that you know is recognized only by uh, American undergraduates, which would, at the time was the only people that we tested. Well, we found out that no, in fact, young children can recognize pride. So the ability to recognize pride emerges as early as four years old, which is the same age at which children acquire the ability to recognize these other emotions as well. We also found that pride is recognized through a quick cognitive process. So this figure shows how quickly people can recognize all the different emotion expressions when they're forced to go as quickly as possible. And these are response latencies or reaction times, so taller bars represent slower responding. So what you see here is that pride is actually one of the most quickly recognized emotion expressions. These are the mean recognition rates when people are forced to go fast or given plenty of time. As you can see, there's no difference. So even when people are forced to respond quickly, they still recognize pride almost at ceiling. And that holds even when people are given a cognitive load. So here they were told they had to rehearse a seven-digit number in mind while recognizing pride. This basically prevents them from devoting any cognitive resources to the recognition task. And the fact that recognition is still high tells us that this is basically an automatic process that doesn't require cognitive resources. So based on these studies, we can conclude that pride recognition is reliable, it emerges early in childhood, and it's a quick and efficient cognitive process, which is great. But of course, none of this gets at the big question that we need to address in order to sort of go back to the Darwinian idea that pride is in fact evolved which is, is pride recognized across cultures? Now, Paul Ekman became famous for answering this question for the six basic emotions I showed you before. Um, you're all probably familiar with his research in Papua New Guinea. He studied the Four tribe in the 1960s, and he found that the people there recognize the same emotion expressions that um, people here do, and um, that, in fact, they show these same expressions as well. So this was great. This is sort of the first evidence of universal emotion expressions. So we knew that in addressing this question for pride, we needed to find a, a fairly isolated, ideally non-Western culture. And we were very fortunate to be able to travel to Burkina Faso, West Africa. Now Burkina, um, at the time that we did this research, was the third poorest country in the world. It's still pretty low down there. Um, 
And because of the poverty there, Burkina Bays are very cut off from the Western world and, and Western culture, and really they're pretty cut off from the, the rest of Africa. We did this research in rural villages, so the people there are kind of separated even from the central cities in, in Burkina. Um, the people in our study were primarily subsistence farmers who practice traditional animistic religions. Uh, they uh, live in mud huts with no electricity or plumbing. They can't read or write and have no formal education, all of which makes them a really ideal sample to address questions of universality. If these people can recognize the pride expression, it's unlikely to be because they learned it from seeing it in a movie or uh, a magazine. But just to make sure they really were completely cut off from Western culture, we devised a little test of uh, Western cultural knowledge. So uh, these images probably kind of date the study. I think if I did it now, maybe Michael Jordan wouldn't be up there. <laughs> um, but in 2003, these were the big people. So um, in any case, hopefully all of you, if I did a little pop quiz, would do pretty well at recognizing all these people. I won't do that. <laughs> Which, <laughs> yeah. I know that guy. <laughs> Who is that guy? <laughs> um, sometimes people don't know the blonde guy. He's a, yeah, world's most famous soccer player, David Beckham, come on. Um, but <laughs> anyway, mo most Westerners, we actually pilot tested this at UC Davis. They did really well. Um, they had a little trouble with that guy up there. But uh, other than that, they were good. Of our Burkina Bay participants, none of them recognized any of these individuals. Um, now we also showed these two. Does anyone know who these two guys are? I let people try to figure it out. It's kind of a trick question. Um, I'd be really impressed if he did. The, the first guy is the president of Burkina Faso, or he was at the time. The second guy is the biggest revolutionary hero in Burkina Faso. He led them to independence uh, from France. I'm sorry, the percentages, these are the percentages of people who recognized each of those photos. Each of these individuals. So 69% of our sample knew that that was their president. Yeah, exactly. 51% uh, knew who this guy was. And these guys, their faces are featured in posters in the major kind of marketplace where, where people go to buy food and such. Also, um, on, on the fabrics that the women's dresses are made of, there's actually often little photos of, of these guys, which is kind of interesting. So it makes sense that they would have some knowledge of who these people are. They're obviously very important within their culture. Um, the nice thing about these data, from my perspective, is that it tells us they understood the task, right? So the zero recognition on the Western figures really is due to the fact that they didn't know who those people were. Um, okay, so the study itself, we used a forced choice response format, which means we show people or give people different emotion word options, and their task is to choose which word best applies to the photo that they see. Um, as you can see, it was in French, which is the official language of Burkina. Now, none of the participants could speak French or understand it. But we had interviewers who'd been raised in the same villages but had left to become educated, which means learning to read and write in French. Um, they read the questionnaire and then translated aloud. Um, and we used uh, African targets. This, this woman's West African. So we used West African targets and white targets. But there was no difference depending on target ethnicity. So the big question, of course, is can these individuals recognize pride? And what we found is that the mean recognition rate in the sample was 57%, which is about five times greater than what we would see if participants were simply guessing randomly among the options. It's also comparable to what we saw for all the other emotions. So these are the mean recognition rates within the sample. And you can see pride is actually one of the best recognized emotions in the sample. Now this figure shows a rough summary of the few previous studies that have looked at similarly highly isolated, non-Western, non-literate samples using a forced choice response method. Not many studies have done this, but there are, I think, about three or four that have. And this is kind of a, a summary of their findings. And I think it's good to see that the pride expression, I, I stuck in our, they didn't look at pride. I stuck in our pride mean recognition right there. Again, it's very comparable to what's been found previously. Um, and people are often surprised by this. I think people know, oh, you know, anger and, or fear and sadness, those are universally recognized. That must mean 100% of people all over can recognize them. And, and no, that's, that's actually not the case. Um, for those of you who do research in these kinds of cultures, you know that you don't ever get 100% recognition. And so, you know, 40% or so is a lot lower than, than people might expect, but, you know, these are Ekman's findings. This is what is typically found. And, and I think there's good reason for that, which I'd be happy to chat about at the end if people are interested. Um, in any case, what I think we can conclude from this is that the pride expression is cross-culturally recognized. And given the isolation of these participants, it may in fact be universally recognized. Um, but this still leaves open a really important question, which is, is this posed prototype that I've been looking at and showing that it's recognizable, 
is it actually displayed spontaneously when people experience a success? This is a really important issue because if we want to make the claim that the pride expression is an adaptation for promoting, for communicating success and promoting status, we need to know that people actually show these behaviors after they've had a success. So to address this issue, I did a study in which we looked at the nonverbal behaviors shown by a group of people from all over the world after they'd experienced the same success, success event, which was um, Olympic success um, in the judo competition at the 2004 Olympic Games. <clears throat> I was very fortunate that my collaborator on this project, David Matsumoto, is actually a judo coach, and so he's got connections, and we were able to obtain photos uh, from an official judo federation photographer. And this guy basically was snapping away from the moment of match completion up to about 10 to 15 seconds afterwards. So we had a series of moment-by-moment -moment shots, essentially, of what happened um, after for, for, all the, for all the athletes. So we compared winners and losers, and we had male and female athletes from 36 different nations which vary on all the major cultural dimensions that a very smart cultural psychologist told me I should care about. Thanks, Ara. Um, <laughs> so we have um, collectivism versus individualism, which is the major dimension that cultural psychologists tend to focus on. And then we've got Engelhart's two major dimensions that sort of divide up uh, the vast majority of uh, variance in cultural world space. Um, so we've got secular versus traditional values and self-expression versus survival values. So we can look at whether these dimensions affect the display of the pride expression. We had a team of four coders look at each photo and rate the extent to which all of the pride behaviors were shown um, by each athlete. And these are just a few of the sample items on the coding scheme that we used. The coding scheme was based on previous research that we did looking at which behaviors constitute recognizable pride. Uh, the scheme includes shame as well, and we did code for shame. I'm not going to present those results, but I have them with me. If people are interested, we can uh, chat about them at the end. Okay, so. Um, are pride behaviors displayed in response to success? That's our critical question here. Well, sure enough, um, what we found is that, is clear? Ooh, that kind of looks kind of messy from here. <laughs> huh, okay, it's weird. Well, that figure didn't really look good, but what it shows is that um, all of the critical pride behaviors, so you can't really read them, but head tilt back, smile, arms extended out from the body, arms raised above the head, hands and fists, chest expanded and torso out. I think that's all the behaviors there. They're all shown to a greater extent by winners than losers. Now if we break the sample up into uh, countries that are high on collectivism versus individualism, and I did this just by using uh, Hofstede's kind of means and taking a median split basically, we get the same effects. So what this says is not only does collectivism, individualism not moderate the findings, but if we actually look only within the subsamples that are highly collectivistic or highly individualistic, we replicate all the effects. We get the same thing if we divide up the countries into survival versus self-expression values. So again, replicate in both groups. And same thing if we divide them up into traditional versus secular rational values. So what this means is that athletes from all over the country, no matter what particular cultural background they have, all tend to display the pride expression in response to success. Okay, so from the studies I've told you about so far, we know that the pride expression seems to be a cross-cultural behavioral response to success, which is consistent with this idea that it's an evolved signal of success. But one thing we don't know is whether it is, in fact, biologically innate. So it's possible these are all athletes, they're professionals, they've obviously seen other people show this pride expression. It may simply be a learned display. They know after success, this is what everyone does, this is what I too should do. Um, so in order to address this issue of whether, in fact, it might be more biologically innate, we needed to look at the behaviors um, of a group of individuals in response to success, and we needed to look at individuals who could not have learned to show these behaviors from watching others. And so what we did was we looked at a sample of blind athletes participating in the Paralympic Games um, in the same 2004 Olympics. So um, again, we had uh, photos from the official Judo Federation photographer and um, winners and losers, male and female athletes, this time only 20 nations. We were less com concerned about culture in this study though and more concerned about another variable, which is blind status. That is, whether or not these people were born blind or not. Um, obviously, if we want to make the claim that pride is shown by people who have never seen anyone show it, we need to look at the congenitally blind. Now, as it turns out, it's not that easy to find out blind status for professional athletes, but we were able to get this information for 69% of the sample. Um, of those, 30% or 12 were congenitally blind. 
which is a really small sample, um, but the research gods were smiling because it was half winners and half losers, which is great, because then we can do our study just within that small sample, knowing, of course, that any effects that emerge as significant have to be really big. Okay, so here's the results across the entire blind sample. And what you see here is a complete replication of the previous findings. This slide looks a little bit nicer, so you can see actually the words. Um, so this shouldn't be surprising. I mean, we replicated the finding within all those different cultures, but I think it's still a nice replication because here's a group of people who experience the world in a very different way, right? I mean, they can't see, um, and yet they show the same behaviors in response to success, so that's good. Um, but of course, the big question is, do the born blind show pride in response to success? And sure enough, what we found is within this small sample, we found significantly greater, uh, let's see, arms raised above the head, hands and fists, chest expanded, and torso out. So four of the critical pride behaviors shown to a greater extent in response to winning than losing. Uh, for arms out from the body and uh, smiling, the effects are clearly there. They're just not quite at significance. And again, with this small sample, effects have to be quite large to reach significance. I think the only real difference here is that head tilt, where we're not seeing any particular evidence of it, um, which might mean that it's not sort of part of the innate pride display. It also might be due to something particular about this congenitally blind sample, and, and that's something we could discuss more at the end if people are interested. Um, in any case, for now, I think what we can conclude is that the pride expression, which is cross-culturally recognized, is also spontaneously displayed in response to success that holds across cultures, across sighted blind and congenitally blind individuals, all of which suggests that the pride expression may in fact be this evolved innate response to success. Um, but we still don't know if it's functional, right? So we're claiming that the pride expression not only occurs in response to success, but does that for a reason. It tells other people about an individual's success, which thereby promotes their status. So to address this question, um, does the pride expression communicate high status? Uh, Azim Sharif and I did a, a number of studies testing whether pride basically is a functional status signal. And what we did was we used a method uh, known as the implicit association test. Are people familiar with that? Anyone? Okay. This is a really widely used method in social psychology, typically used to measure implicit racial bias, so associations between positive and negative concepts and African Americans versus white people, for example. That's not at all what we used it for, but that gives you an idea of, of what the test is. It measures implicit associations between concepts. Our question was, is the pride expression implicitly associated with high status? And um, the reason we're interested in implicit associations is because if pride, in fact, evolved to communicate high status, then perceivers should automatically infer high status from the, from the expression. They shouldn't have to think and deliberate in order to know that a proud person deserves high status. It should be sort of this pre-linguistic, pre-conscious form of communication. So we developed a pride status IAT. And again, this research was led by Azim. Um, so what we did was we told people, you're going to see two positions. Now, the positions are actually emotion expressions, but um, you know, we told them position. They probably knew they were emotion expressions, but we didn't get specific about it. Position A was always a guy showing pride, and position B was a guy showing shame. And we paired these positions with higher low status words. We used words that were previously validated to indicate higher low status. So um, what this would mean if, if you're actually in the study is participants would have their uh, left and right index finger on the J and uh, F key, and they would be told, you're going to press one key, say your left index finger, if you see a high status word appear on screen, or if you see a position A photo appear on screen. And they memorize what position A looked like, so they got that. And you're going to press your right index finger if you see a low status word appear on screen, or if you see a position B photo appear on screen. So in this condition, low status words are being paired with position B, high status words are being paired with position A. And just to make sure you guys really fully get this, um, if you wouldn't mind playing along for a moment, if you all could pretend on your lap, you guys are like, no, I really don't want to do this. It's going to be fun. Play on your lap, pretend that your left index finger you're going to press if you see a high status word or a position A photo, and your right index finger you're going to press if you see a low status word or a position B photo. Everyone got that? So we can press both. Yes, you should press both, but not at the same time. <laughs> um, no, but if you see both, you press both. You won't see anything. You won't see multiple things at the same time. You're only going to see one image at a time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not as hard as it looks. Uh, <laughs> right. So, okay. Left index finger is high status or position A photo. Right index finger is low status or position B photo. Here we go. Okay. 
Hopefully that wasn't too tough. Um, now we're going to switch things up. So what would happen then is some, all participants would then, some people did this condition first, but basically there were two within subjects conditions. The other condition, which you're going to do now, is now we're switching it up so that your left index finger is still position A, but now a low status word, okay? Right index finger is position B, or a high status word. So in other words, we're switching the pairings. Is that pretty clear? Okay. And again, some people did this condition first. We counterbalance the order. Okay, everyone ready? So now left index finger is low status position A, right index finger is high status position B. Here we go. Okay. So hopefully you guys got a sense of which of those conditions was more difficult. Um, if you're like most of our participants, the second condition was much harder, right? So what this figure shows is that these are response latencies again, so taller bars are slower responding. People are much faster when they're pairing the pride expression with high status and the shame expression with low status compared to when they're pairing shame with high status and pride with low status. Is that pretty clear? Any questions about the methodology here? Okay. So what this tells us is that the pride expression is implicitly associated with high status. Or the shame expression is implicitly associated with low status. And probably both, right? I mean, certainly shame is going to be driving part of these effects. So we followed this up with another study in which we compared pride to a series of other emotions not theoretically related to status. So we chose disgust, fear, and happiness. None of them particularly should convey <laughs> higher or low status. Um, and did the same study. And we got the same effects. So again, pride, high status pairing, other emotions, low status pairing, much quicker, much easier association for people to make than other emotions with high status and pride with low status. Um, which is good, since the other emotions, again, you know, don't particularly relate to low status. But there are some other possible issues here um, that we wanted to address. So, for example, one possibility is that the association is due to positive valence. So, Pride is a good thing, high status is a good thing, people might just be putting good things together. So we did a study in which we compared pride with just happiness, which is more positive than pride, really. So if that's what's going on here, it should wipe out the effect or maybe happiness will be more strongly associated with high status. We did another one where we compared um, pride with anger. We thought, well, maybe this is about high power emotions. And certainly pride is a high power emotion, but there are other high power emotions out there, like anger. Um, and we did one where we thought, you know, the pride expression looks different than these other expressions. Because in these other expressions, the guy's arms are always at his side. Maybe just they see the arms out from the body, and they think, ooh, that's big. And they think status is big. And so there's just sort of a bigness being used as a heuristic. So we created this funny uh, expression where the guy's just showing a neutral face, but he's got his arms out. And we had his arms in different configurations. It's kind of a nonsense expression. We didn't want it to look like pride, obviously. But the key thing is, if people are just using arms as a heuristic, this will wipe out the effect. Is it all pretty clear? OK, and what you see here is that no matter what comparison we did, the pride high status association was always the fastest. right? So um, faster than, than happy high status, pride low status, faster than angry, and faster than the funny arms thing. Um, which tells us that the pride high status association is not due to positivity, power, or arms. Um, so this suggests that the pride expression is, in fact, an implicitly perceived status signal. But there's still um, an important question here, which is that I've shown you these photos, or I've shown participants these photos, completely decontextualized, right? All they're seeing is this expression. And that's important. It tells us something about what happens when people see the expression. But we know that in real life, typically we know a little bit of contextual information about the person showing the expression. What happens when that contradicts with the meaning of the expression, right? What's going to win out? Um, Another important question is what happens when observers have time to deliberate? Now, the fact that this is an automatic implicit response is really important, um, certainly for the evolutionary perspective. But we know that most of the status judgments we make that are most important, we hopefully deliberate a bit about, right? Who to hire or fire, who to vote for. And so it might be the case that when we deliberate, we don't pay any attention to emotions. We actually use our rational, contextually bound knowledge. So we did a few studies to address these issues. Um, First, to address the context issue, we did this uh, expression versus context study. Um, so what we did was we, we showed people a pair of twins, Mark and Steve. Um, and um, Mark and Steve, they were told, were both members of their, their college's varsity soccer team. They were told a little story about them. The basic idea here is that Mark is the, the best guy on the team. He's the captain. Um, he's great. Everyone loves him. Steve, 
isn't so good. Uh, when he's sidelined, he, he basically is the water boy. And in case that wasn't obvious enough from the story, it's honed in in their t-shirts there. Um, OK, so clearly there's a status differential here, which people get right away. When we ask them, you know, rate the status of these two guys, big difference. So then we put them in an IAT. So um, now we're pairing low status or high status words with the captain, who's high status, or the water boy, who's low status, which should be a no-brainer, except we showed these guys showing emotions that were incongruent with the contextually bound status. So they always saw Mark the captain showing shame, and they always saw Steve the water boy showing pride. Okay? And then they're pairing these guys, again, with high status words or low status words, and the question is, what wins out, right? If it's all about context, then people should be quicker when they're pairing the captain with high status and the water boy with low status, right? It shouldn't matter that they're showing incongruent emotion expressions. But if the emotions matter, that effect might dissipate, right? Any questions? Be clear? OK. And here you can see the opposite pairings, right? So um, I think this is context congruent, expression incongruent. OK, so this is what we found. Um, what this figure shows is that people are faster when the expression is congruent to the status words, even though the context is incongruent, than they are when the context is congruent. So in other words, when the water boy showing pride is paired with high status and the captain showing shame is paired with low status, that's faster than the reverse pairings, suggesting that expression is more powerful than context in this situation. Right? That's what's guiding the status judgments here. Um, so this is pretty cool. But we thought, you know, what if the context is even stronger? So we have this water boy versus captain thing, which you know, I think is, is nice because it's a real world kind of contextual um, status differential that people deal with on a regular basis. I mean, this is something most college students can wrap their head around, right? I get it, water boy versus captain, kind of obvious. But there are stronger contextually based status differences out there. And perhaps if we just made context stronger, emotion wouldn't be so powerful. So right when we were trying to figure this out, we were very fortunate to meet a pair of twins who um, one of them is a successful businessman, and uh, the other, I'm, I'm kidding, of course, these are both my, my student, Alec Beale. Um, so we had Alec pose as a successful businessman, and we also had him pose as his twin brother, uh, down on his luck, uh, homeless guy. Um, so this is kind of the strongest status differential we could conceive of. Uh, if anyone has a, has a stronger one, I'd be interested in hearing it. But in terms of day to day, what you might actually you know, realistically encounter, I think this kind of really gets at it. Um, and we told them, you know, the twin brothers, uh, one of them is, is successful in finance, the other one is homeless. OK, so we did the IAT again. And <laughs> once again, expressions incongruent with the context, right? So the businessman is showing shame, homeless guy, really proud, right? Um, and again, they're, they're pairing these with the high and low status words. And here you can see the, oh, oh, so here what we did was we thought, okay, we want to show the emotion incongruent expressions, but we also thought, you know, it's not just important to ask can expression or context which wins out, but we thought we need to see how much expressions change things from, from a neutral kind of condition. So the issue here is, um, we want to know, if they both do show a neutral expression, is there an effect, which there should be, right? I mean, this is a really strong status differential. But then, then we can comparatively look at what emotions are doing to that effect. So it gives us a better sense of exactly what the power of emotions are. Okay, so here's the findings when uh, they both show neutral expressions. So this is pure context, right? No emotion happening here. And what you can see, not surprisingly, businessman low status, homeless man no, businessman high status, homeless man low status, much faster associations than the reverse. And uh, for those of you familiar with effect sizes, this is like the biggest Cohen's D I've ever seen. So, but that's not surprising. I mean, here we have a blatant context difference. It should be a huge effect. What's interesting is when we, instead we show these guys showing incongruent emotion expressions, so proud homeless man, shame businessman, we wipe out that effect entirely. So now the difference is completely nullified. Um, Unlike in the Captain Waterboy condition, expression is an overpowering context. We don't see the reversal here. But we do see that that really large effect was nullified. And in fact, the difference between these two bars and these two bars is also a large effect. Um, so what this tells us, essentially, is that when you throw in incongruent emotion expressions, in, even in this incredibly powerful contextual situations, um, context has no effect on status judgments. Right? Emotion completely wipes it out. And so, um, a homeless man who shows pride is actually considered equally high status to a businessman who shows shame. Okay, 
uh, last thing in the series of studies, we also wanted to know what happens when people deliberate, right? So um, implicit judgments clearly seem to be guided by emotions, at least to some extent. But what happens when people actually have the time to think about their judgments and can really process? At that point, emotions may be less relevant, right? Then they should use context. So we went back to Go, Mark, and Steve, and same story about the soccer team and Captain and Waterboy. But now what people are told is, we just want you to make a bunch of judgments. Take your time, you know, no, no, no implicit priming stuff here. Just tell us who's more likely to do things like date the head cheerleader, get bumped to first class, uh, be approached by friends for personal advice. So classic high status stuff, and we had a whole bunch of these that we used. And to make sure people were really uh, motivated to, to deliberate, we actually gave them a reward. We told them there were correct answers here, and the more correct answers they would get, uh, the more entries into a draw they would get. So they were motivated to do well. Some, some participants saw Mark and Steve exactly like this, showing neutral expressions. Other participants saw them with the uh, emotions that were incongruent to context. Right? So two conditions here between subjects. So here's what we found when the two guys showed neutral expressions. So not surprising, 83% of the high status items are attributed to the captain over the water boy. Right? And that makes sense. In fact, if anything, I would have thought it would be even higher. But probably people are sort of thinking, gosh, you know, got to give the low status guy something. Um, but still, you know, that's, that's a very large effect. OK, what happens when they show emotion incongruent expressions? Well, the effect is substantially reduced. Um, it's still greater than chance. So in this case, when people deliberate, they are using context, right? They are still attributing more high status things to the captain than the water boy, but a whole lot less than they did when the guys showed neutral expressions, telling us that when emotions are present, people use, and, they, and people have time to deliberate, they use both emotions and context to make their judgments. Okay, so thinking about pride as a status signal, we know that the pride expression, it seems, in some situations, can overpower context in communicating status. And there's a distinction in the way that works between implicit and explicit perception. So when deliberative resources are available, people do take context into account to a greater extent, um, which suggests the pride status signal may, in fact, be evolutionarily ancient, right? If it is this evolved signal, that's how we would expect it to work. But of course, the critical question that we have to address to get at this evolutionary argument is, again, the same one we had to address to see if pride was um, a universal expression, which is, does pride communicate high status across cultures? And we've just begun research uh, addressing this question, and we are currently collecting more data as we speak. People are collecting data on this, so this is sort of hot off the presses. We just have some preliminary results that I want to share with you guys. Um, this is work done that Azim and I did in, in collaboration with Joe Henrik and his student Wen Ying Zhao. So we did this research in Fiji, um, which is where Joe has done a lot of work. Um, and it was in the village of Teka on Yasaiwa Island. Um, and Joe can tell you a lot more about it than I can. But basically, it's a small-scale society that lives there that Joe has studied quite a bit. They have a hereditary system of leadership involving mostly chiefdoms, um, which means status concerns are something you know, central and, and prominent in this culture. So what we did was we did the um, pride high status IAT that Azim and I had did where we compared pride and shame expressions or had people associate them with high and low status words. Um, we changed it a bit to make it work in this culture. So we translated the status words into Fijian. We had an interviewer who would read the words aloud for people who couldn't read so much. And um, responses we had recorded with these large external buttons to the laptop rather than having them, given that these are people who don't use computers, we wanted to make it as simple as possible Rather than have them press keys, they had these uh, external buttons they used, which seemed to work quite well. Um, so here's the study again. Uh, so they see position A, position B, pride, shame, high and low status words. Uh, we used some photos of the white guy that I showed you before. We didn't have time to have a Fijian pose these expressions, unfortunately, but we just wanted to at least include some other ethnicity. So we had photos of an African uh, posing it. We, we used those as well. And again, there was no ethnicity, target ethnicity differences at all. OK, so here's what we found. Um, what this shows is that, again, pride, high status, shame, low status, those associations are much faster than when people are pairing pride with low status and shame with high status, um, which is consistent with what we found in Canada. So this suggests that the pride high status association may, in fact, generalize across cultures. And, and the other thing to note here is the reaction times that we see are actually almost identical to what we saw in uh, the UBC sample, which is in some ways surprising. I mean, here are people who, who don't use computers at all, and yet they're responding just as quickly. But I think it gets at sort of the basicness of this, you know, we're talking about a motor response and a basic cognitive association, and it doesn't require a whole lot of computer knowledge to, to be able to do it, basically. 
Um, anyway, we're, we're obviously, there's a lot of follow-up that needs to be done here and um, a lot of places this research can go, which we're excited about. But um, for now, I want to kind of move on, uh, sum up what I've told you about the pride expression so far, which is that uh, it's universally recognized. It seems to be an innate behavioral response to success. Um, it communicates high status, both implicitly and explicitly, and even when contextual information indicates low status. And it seems to do this across cultures as well. All of which is consistent with this claim that pride may have evolved as a functional status signal. Which gets us back to this figure that I showed you at the beginning of my talk. And I think the findings I presented so far are consistent with this side of the figure. With the, uh, with the little time that I have left, I want to move on and quickly tell you about just a few studies that I've done that get at this side of the figure, looking at the pride experience. Now, so far, I've been talking about pride as if it's this sort of really great, you know, adaptive, it, it promotes social status, it's, it's all good kind of thing. But there are other ideas about pride out there. Okay, so this quote says, uh, all seven deadly sins partake of the sin of pride, the deadliest. Thus, gluttony goes with pride, avarice goes with pride, etc. Once in a while, we beat our signature sin into submission and tower over it. But pride is never defeated. So this quote suggests something of a darker side of pride, right? And of course, we all know pride has long been considered this deadly sin. Here's another quote getting at that. Around the time of grammar school, I had this incredible desire to be recognized. I didn't care about the money. I thought about the fame, about just being the greatest. I was dreaming about being a dictator of a country or some savior, like Jesus, just to be recognized. This quote is actually from uh, the governor of California um, <laughs> many years ago. Um, and uh, I think this quote sort of tells us why pride has this dark side, which is, of course, it's also associated with narcissism. And the idea that there's two different kinds of pride or two facets of pride has been circulating in the psychological and, and philosophical and religious literatures for a very long time. Um, we wrote a paper in 2004 arguing that there are, in fact, two distinct, building on all this work, of course, arguing that there are two facets of pride. And, and we called the first one the good pride, authentic pride. And we argued this is the pride that promotes social investments, like committing to a career or a relationship. Um, and it's probably the pride that fosters genuine self-esteem. But there's also this more hubristic pride, right? And this is the narcissistic pride that may contribute to hostility and aggression. So to test whether there was any evidence or any empirical support for this two-facet theory, um, we did a couple studies. We first wanted to know, do people conceptualize pride? Do they think about it in terms of these two facets? So we got a whole bunch of pride words um, in different ways. We did a study where we just asked people to list words that you think of when you think about pride. This shows you all the different words that were listed by people. Um, we then took these words and paired them up, and we asked people, other people, to rate the similarity of each pair, right? So in other words, they'd say, okay, how similar are achieve and pride, and, and they'd rate it on the scale. And what you can then do, you have all these similarity ratings, you can plug them into a cluster analysis to see what kinds of uh, structure, is the, the conceptual structure there. We plugged it in actually to a Pathfinder analysis, which is a little bit different, but it's cool because it shows you actually the specific interrelations between all the words. This is the path model that resulted from that analysis. And um, I think what, what seems pretty clear here is that there are two distinct clusters of words stemming out from that central word proud. And if you look at the words in the top half, they all fit with this authentic pride conceptualization, whereas the words in the bottom half fit much more clearly with the hubristic pride conceptualization. So it looks like people do think about pride in terms of these two clusters. Um, but of course, that doesn't mean they experience pride that way, right? So we then did a study um, to look at how people experience pride. So we had a group of uh, participants. We, we said to them, describe a time when you felt very proud of yourself. This is a standard emotion manipulation procedure. Uh, they then would write a narrative, which would get them kind of in the, in the emotional mood. So we had one participant who wrote, I was awarded the All League honor. These were undergrads. Um, I had worked hard to play well, and when the honor was announced, I felt proud of myself. The years of practice and hard work had paid off. It's a good little pride scenario. Um, they then rated all of our pride words. We factor analyzed their ratings, and we found two fairly independent factors emerged. These are some of the words that loaded highest on each factor, and if you look at the, the content of these words, it fits pretty well, again, with this authentic versus hubristic pride distinction. Um, we then replicated these, these uh, analyses in, in seven more studies, sometimes measuring pride in the way that I just told you as a state, sometimes measuring it more as a dispositional trait. No matter what we do, when you factor analyze these words, you always get these same two factors. And we've used these results to, to build these scales that um, are validated and can be used to measure each facet of pride. Okay, so um, this is the excerpt I showed you before. 
it's from someone who was high on authentic pride. Here's an excerpt from someone who was high in hubristic pride. I felt very proud of myself when I got a 4.0 GPA. I would initiate conversations by asking groups of people how they did last quarter. After hearing their response, I would obviously mention my success. I love that. Um, which, is, which is a nice excerpt, because I think it really gives you a feel for what this hubristic pride is like. Okay, so what is, this, what is hubristic pride like? How can we conceptualize this distinction? Well, as I mentioned, we argued that the distinction is really about sort of a genuine versus a narcissistic pride, where authentic pride is kind of true pride um, based in genuine self-esteem. Hubristic pride is this more self-aggrandized narcissistic pride. Sure enough, if we look at correlations between the two facets and genuine self-esteem controlling for narcissism, narcissistic self-aggrandizement controlling for self-esteem, we see a pattern that fits with this. So genuine self-esteem, positively related to state and trait authentic pride, negatively related to hubristic pride. Narcissistic self-aggrandizement is more strongly positively related to hubristic pride. Um, these are some other traits that are related to the, these issues that I think get at the same issues. So here we have trait measures of authentic and hubristic pride. And what this tells us is that people high in trait authentic pride are low in narcissistic personality disorder, which is like clinical narcissism. Uh, they're low in aggression, but they're high in perceived social support, meaning they have a lot of friends. And they're high in implicit self-esteem, which means deep down they really feel good about themselves. People high in trait hubristic pride, in contrast, are high in narcissistic personality disorder. They're highly aggressive. Uh, they tend to engage in misbehaviors. Those are sort of petty crimes, um, speeding, drug use, things like that. Um, they're high in Machiavellianism, uh, so manipulative and power-seeking. They're low in perceived social support, meaning they're actually not very well-liked. And they're low in implicit self-esteem, which suggests that hubristic pride might actually be sort of a defensive response to deep-seated feelings of insecurity. Uh, these are correlations with the big five traits of personality. These are kind of the dimensions that personality researchers care most about. Um, and what this, what this tells us is that people high in authentic pride basically have everything good in personality, right? They're extroverted, they're agreeable, they're conscientious, they're emotionally stable, and they're open to new experiences. People high in hubristic pride are disagreeable. Um, so what these correlations tell us is that these are two really distinct dimensions, right? I mean, they're very divergent. I mean, they're both pride, but they're quite distinct, which raises, I think, the question of why do we have this bad pride, right? How might a dark-sided or hubristic pride have evolved? Why would it be adaptive? Well, I was trying to figure out the answer to this question right around the time that I moved to UBC, and I was very fortunate that at the same time our psychology department hired me, they also hired Joe Henrik, who um, I learned very quickly had developed a two-facet model of status. So um, Joe, it turns out, has argued that there are two distinct kinds of status, one of which is called prestige, which is, um, you can think of this as sort of uh, respect-based status. So this is status we can associate it with the persuasive leader. Someone gets status because they deserve it. They're smart, they have skills that other people want to copy. Um, it's earned status, essentially. And then there's a kind of status called dominance, and this is more of a fear-based status. These people get status because they, they force it out of other people, right? They're essentially scary. They have more control in one way or another um, than the people below them, and so they, uh, people below them have to give them status. And so if you think about this distinction, well, it fits really well with the hubristic authentic pride distinction. Um, and one important thing to note here is that both of these kinds of status are in fact, or both, both of these are effective routes to attaining status, right? In other words, even though dominance seems like, you know, who'd want to do that? It's actually, it's, it, it's adaptive, right? I mean, it gets people status and all of the rewards that come with it. So um, this fits with our evolutionary model. Okay, so um, what, we, what we are arguing here is that um, authentic pride, which is associated with traits like conscientiousness, high self-esteem, and social support, well, those traits are going to promote things like displaying skills, uh, advice giving, pro-sociality. Um, and all of these behaviors, of course, are what would lead to prestige. Um, hubristic pride, in contrast, is associated with traits like disagreeableness, hostility, Machiavellianism, misbehavior, traits that promote threat, intimidation, and aggression, which in turn are going to lead to dominance. So um, Joe and Joey Chang, my student, is actually leading this research. We're currently testing these ideas. Um, we did a couple studies to look at this. We first just measured trait pride and status. So um, we asked people to self-report their dominance and prestige. We developed these scales to, to get at these issues. So items include things like, I try to control others rather than let them control me. That's dominance. Members of my peer group respect and admire me. That's prestige. And then we correlated them with trait levels of authentic and hubristic pride. And sure enough, what we found is that dominance, positively, strongly related to trait hubristic pride, 
whereas prestige is more positively and strongly related to authentic pride. So this is some preliminary good support here, but of course, when we're talking about status, really what we want is how other people see you, right? We don't want to know how high status you think we, you are. We want to know how high status your peers think you are. So we did a second study in which we um, looked at real-world hierarchical groups, uh, specifically UBC varsity athletic teams. And we um, had the teammates provide peer ratings of five of their teammates on prestige and dominance. And then we got self-ratings on authentic and hubristic pride. And uh, what we found is that in predicting prestige, authentic pride is a significant and positive predictor, whereas hubristic pride had no effect on peer-rated prestige. Um, for dominance, we see exactly the opposite pattern. So hubristic pride, a positive, significant predictor. Authentic pride has no effect. And all this suggests that, in fact, the two facets of pride may, in fact, be associated with these distinct forms of status. OK, so what this suggests is it's consistent with our evolutionary account. And actually, it suggests that there may be reason to think that not only is pride on the whole evolved, but actually the two facets of pride may be distinct adaptations. Um, one interesting thing to note is that in Joe's model, dominance is the more evolutionarily ancient form of status. It's what's seen in non-human primates, for example, which suggests that to the extent that these animals experience pride, it's going to be something closer to the hubristic kind of pride. I don't think they do experience pride, but whatever the kind of generalized form of superiority they feel is probably more like human hubristic pride than authentic pride. Um, another interesting thing is that prestige, according to Joe's model, it emerged with the human need to transmit culture. Um, so when that happens, possession of wills and wisdom and skills is very adaptive. And so demonstrating skills becomes socially rewarded by prestige. So what this suggests is that authentic pride may actually be the affective me mechanism underlying this process, right? That is, affective pride, and authentic pride may motivate people to build up skills and display them to others and, and thereby underlie essentially the transmission of culture. OK, so I want to quickly um, sum up by showing you a quick results of a study that people always ask this question when I present the two facets research, having just presented all the expression research. An obvious kind of question is, well, are there two pride expressions? And, and given the data that I just showed you with dominance and prestige, one might think there should be. Um, we conducted a couple studies to address this issue, basically just showing people different versions of the pride expression. These are just two examples, but we had a whole bunch of different versions. And for each photo, they would just be asked, does the person feel more? And then we give them a bunch of words representing authentic pride and a bunch of words representing hubristic pride. They'd have to choose which best characterize the photo. What we found across studies, no matter what photo we show, there's really no difference, right? People can't agree on this. They kind of are 50-50 hubristic authentic pride, um, suggesting that there, there aren't two distinct expressions at the decontextualized level, um, which is surprising in many ways. But I think what it, really, what it really shows is how important context is in these kinds of situations. Um, so here's Lance Armstrong, and if I tell you that's Lance right after he won his seventh Tour de France, I think we'd all interpret that as authentic pride and think, wow, that Lance, he's, he's a prestigious guy. Um, but if instead I tell you, well, actually, that photo was taken after Lance won a race with his five-year-old around the block, um, <laughs> I think it looks a little bit different now. <laughs> um, OK, so to sum up the studies that I've told you about today, um, I began my talk by presenting some research on the pride expression and evidence that it's reliably recognized, it's cross-culturally recognized, seems to be a spontaneous uh, and possibly innate behavioral response to success, which functions as an implicit and, and sometimes explicit status signal. And all of this is consistent with this idea that the pride expression evolved to serve a communicative adaptive function, probably relevant to communicating high social status. I then told you about some research that I've done on the psychological structure of pride presented some evidence for two distinct facets, authentic and hubristic, and showed you some new evidence we found suggesting that these facets each uniquely affect two different forms of high status, prestige, and dominance. So on the whole, what I think this research suggests is that the pride expression and the pride psychological structure actually may work together to promote the adaptive function of enhancing and sustaining social status. And that's it. Thank you.
study is consistent across age groups. Do people get better at recognizing pride as they get older, or is this um, completely the same whether you're testing children or middle right, well, aged so or old? Older. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so I showed you the four-year-old data, right? So okay. one thing you noticed, you might have noticed, is that recognition was lower in four-year-olds. Mm -hmm. It was about 65%, which is typical of, of all emotions. And um, I had, I don't think I included it, I had a slide that actually showed uh, the trajectory across age. Basically, it ceilings out at about eight. So after eight years old, everyone's at about 89, 90%. So you can't really look at differences at that level because everyone's so high. But it does rise slowly from four to, you know, a little higher at five, a little higher at six, a little higher at seven. And the trajectory looks almost identical to the trajectory for other emotions. Have you tested this in animals? Like, uh, did it cross comparison as well? To, like, to see like the age and to see if it has any um, evolutionary links that it's something that you get after a certain point in development? I don't know how to word that question better. <laughs> Uh, like, what? if it's universal, like we sh we see this in um, chimps and bonobos okay, and other primates. Yes. And to some extent, you can also see um, kind of universal expressions people see in their pets and their dogs or cats. Oh. But I don't know if there's any study trying to like right. how how universal it might be. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I understand that. Okay. So great question. Um, this is an issue that actually we're doing research now. Jason, my student Jason Martins and Joey Chang and I are doing a study with a primatologist um, in Georgia to basically see whether in fact, now I don't think primates experience pride in the same way that we do at all, but they do have a dominance display. It's called a bluff display. And so we're doing this study now where we're coding the behaviors shown by these animals when they're showing the bluff display to see to what extent do they actually correspond to the pride behaviors. Um, and so far, it looks like there's a lot of correspondence, that a lot of the specific behaviors shown in the chimp bluff display are almost identical to the behaviors that we see in humans, um, which isn't to say that there aren't differences as well. Of course, there are. And I think there are going to be differences in when the display is shown. So the bluff display is actually typically shown prior to an agonistic encounter, almost to threaten or scare someone off, whereas pride, of course, is typically shown in response to a success. So I think that might be an important transition that occurred. Um, in phylogenetic history. But I do think there's going to be something there, and I think it's really important to look at this to see whether that is where this display comes from, which my guess is it does. In terms of the pets thing, I don't think you're going to see anything there because um, I think it's, it's, I think you need to have some level of self-concept in order to experience an emotion like pride. Um, so some self-awareness, at least the ability to say, you know, hey, that's me, I'm, I'm more powerful than the others. And there's not much evidence of any kind of self-representational ability in cats and dogs, if that's the pet you were talking about. But, yeah. No. I was just wondering um, how this becomes uh, evolutionarily stable. I mean, it seems like a system that would be very easily invaded by cheetahs, so right. that, that, you know, fake pride must be under strong selective pressure. Right. To, to why, <laughs> so why, why can't people fake it is basically the idea. Well, how does it become a, a stable industry? Right. Yeah. Yeah, the homeless guy who fakes it is going to do pretty well. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Um, and, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> um, the longer answer is, uh, you know, I think it's, I think, so at first I, I used to think that there's ways that, you know, people can tell the difference between these things, but the new, co the context data we have shows that clearly they can't. The fact that, you know, here's context telling you one thing and here's the expression telling you another. But I think that, yeah. Right. Maybe. Maybe we're not picking up on. I mean, we had the actors. We told them they didn't just pose according to how they wanted. We said, do this, do that, based on based on what we think the actual display is. But you're right, maybe we're missing that key, hidden, reliable signal. No, they don't. That's a good point. That's actually a really good point, yeah. So I don't know if that's, one could learn to, right? So, but it's not, I mean, if, yeah. And this is, this is typical of all emotion expressions, that if you say, pose fear, 
Um, I don't care how good an actor you are, it's not, it's typically not well recognized, um, and, and that's been shown in a lot of, it, it makes it hard to get good posers. If instead you say, hold your mouth this way, or in the case of pride, hold your body this way, stand this way, then you can get it pretty good. But we're instructing them based on what we know from previous research. But of course someone could learn to fake it. I, I do think that's possible. I mean, the, the best answer I have for that question is that's going to require a complicated process of deliberation and using context and using knowledge and it's, yeah, it's problematic. So. I don't think it needs to be uh, so much as, as, as people learning to do, but just in terms of there being a lot of uh, noise in the system. Right. So, you know, you might imagine that you know, Ted feels pride when he, <coughs> when he scores a sandwich. Yeah. You know, puffing out his chest, and, and somebody who has a book published yeah. and, and has exactly the same display. So there's, it's totally. that there's a huge gap. Yeah. Totally. Well, I think part of it, though, is going to be I think that might, and this is just sort of preliminary, but the hubristic authentic distinction I think comes into play there. So one thing we have found is that if we show pride uh, decontextualized, like I showed you 50 50, people don't know, which it is. But if you give a little bit of context, people will very easily go to one or the other. So if it's a success and they know it's a success, we tell them, hey, this guy just did really well in an important tennis game, they're going to go more authentic pride. Instead, if we, if we tell them things you know, that don't indicate success or that indicate maybe this guy is a bit of a jerk, people go hubristic pride. And so I think it might be, it's sort of, I mean, it's still, they're still going to, I mean, if, if the dominance prestige argument is right, they're still going to get some sort of status. But the bias seems to be to assume um, what's sort of safer, right? So if there's any evidence that this guy is a jerk, you know, or, or, or doesn't deserve it, is just showing pride because of his sandwich, they're gonna see hubristic pride, think maybe, maybe he doesn't actually deserve me to copy him, right? He might not have any skills that I particularly want to follow, but there's something about him, he's powerful, I need to watch out for him and make sure he doesn't hurt me, right? Which is, I think, a safe response. Whereas if you have evidence, hey, this guy did have a success, then you're gonna make the attribution that assumes so, it, I mean, it takes a lot of sort of paying attention, I think, but, yeah. I was just going to follow up on what you just said. I mean, most of the, the signals that they show in pride uh, making the posture bigger, like making the, the body bigger, right. which is in all mammals, uh, usually a sign of uh, being the dominant type in, in the conflict. Mm -hmm. So, maybe the, there's a correlation of the signals between pride and something older that is uh, dominance in conflict situations. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it could be that it's harder for, for anyone to distinguish between the two of them. And when you put that into the power context, that, for example, you have to be scared of that person because you might be more powerful, right. then it's very difficult to, to distinguish between those two functions. Right. I mean, I, th I think, right, so you're saying... You're saying that the expression... There, there, there would, there would, you wouldn't expect any difference between the heuristic and the, and the real one. Because it could be, when the signal is older, when the signal right. has been evolved way right. before, right. And, it, and it is correlated with dominance right. and conflict. No, I totally see that. And I, and I agree. I think that's why there aren't two distinct yeah. expressions. Because, we, yeah, we looked for it and we didn't see it. So I think, you're, I think that's where the higher level context stuff needs to come into play. Yeah. I wondered if you... I wondered if you had any surprises. Was anything unexpected in your results? It seems a bit self-evident, that's why I'm wondering. Oh, really? Interesting. Well, I would say the very first finding we got was surprising. Um, I mean, this, this is a common issue, you know, where after a study, you always say, oh, of course the pride expression is recognizable. But I swear to God, when, when I did the very first study when I was in grad school, my advisor and I sat down and he said, you're not going to find any recognition on this. And I said, let's see. So, and, and, you know, I don't think he's a crazy guy. I think, I think it could have gone either way, to be, to be fair. And no one had done it before, which says that it's not an obvious to me, because if it was obvious, you know, someone would have already shown it, I think. So I think it's easy to look at the findings after the fact and say, of course. But I, I wouldn't, you know, necessarily. Even when I did the, the thing with the blind athletes, I remember telling my former advisor about that study, and he's like, what will you do if you don't get the findings you want? You know, he thought, he, was almost, he wasn't saying don't do the research, of course, but he's like, wow, this is really risky because, you know, maybe it won't pan out. So. Um, what would you think, how would you respond to the argument that these are dominance displays that you're showing rather than pride displays? So what person, do you mean by dominance displays? Well, as in how animals would display dominance, or just saying like in a judo victory, I'm just thinking that's a victory over some 
So in another kind of situation where you get a paper published. Right. Um, you don't do this? Be doing the, the I think same they do. response. I mean, I think, of course, you know, the situation the situation is going to affect it. Um, right. So, so that, the Olympics is a great situation to measure this stuff because there's no regulatory need to not show your pride. I mean, that's like about as, you know, accepted socially success that we can have, you know, in the world probably. So no problems. Everyone's going to show their pride. In most day-to-day -day situations, there's a lot of, you know, cultural norms about you're not supposed to show that much pride. You can't act that excited. Which isn't to say, I bet every person here, when they get a paper accepted, shows a little bit of pride. Um, so I think, yeah, you would get it in any situation, but I think the cultural norms of the situation are going to determine the extent to which it's shown, for sure. Is that? Yeah. So, so uh, I'm just wondering if the pride display just could be the co-opted dominance display over time. That right. The feeling associated with I think dominance. It, I think it could be. I think it could be. But I think it's much more than dominance at this point, because pride you know, has these, all these different complex meanings. And, and so, yeah. But yeah, no, I think that's probably the, the origins of it. Yes. So I had the same worry about yeah, being no, fakeable, know. and this is my standard thing with signaling, right? I uh -huh. always worry about faking. Right. And what first occurred to me, I was actually already thinking about, well, what about false pride? And so when you talk about the heuristic true pride distinction, you, you present them as two separate adaptations. But maybe there's an adaptation to display true pride that displays dominant, that displays your you know, actual status. And then heuristic pride is the failure of that signal to work. Huh. Um, so they're not two separate adaptations. It's just the, the one that is recognized, people recognize that it works. Right. And the other one where people go, oh, no, he's just trying too hard. That's interesting. Um, so it's a failure of that signal to But be the accepted. signal doesn't look any different. But that's where I think you need to get Maybe different we found front. It. You need to have yeah. people who are, you're not, coaching them, you have to have show Maybe. people who are really feeling, and that might be tricky, you have to find, right. you have a camera in somebody's office and then they get the call, an email that their paper was accepted, <laughs> taking pictures of, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. You have monitors, somebody 24-7. But you know what I mean? Right, that makes sense because if it. your signaling theory really works at all, it's got to be involved in voluntary very difficult to fake things. Mm -hmm. And I would suspect that one of the difference between pride, heuristic pride thing is there's got to be pupil, di there's got to be some kind of involuntary Something. physiological reaction. Maybe. Um, or I just don't see how it would get off the ground. Yeah, so. no, it's it's certainly possible there's something we haven't picked up on. Yeah. What about the, um, so we have that uh, uh, recent study with Joey where we, we, we film the people and then code the eye trackers. It seems like we were detecting some differences between the prestigious and dominant individuals there. Right. So, so in this study, so Joey's got this study um, where basically people are in a group interacting, right? And there we have dominant people and prestigious people, and then we have other people watch the video while they're in an eye tracker, so you can see what they're looking at, right? <laughs> and and what's the finding? The well, Joe talked more about the behavioral. Yeah, we code the behavioral. Oh, oh, yeah. readiness to tax, so they show more expensive make themselves appear bigger, whereas the prestigious people tend to show elements of pride that uh, are more subtle, right? So they puff up their chest a little more, but they don't put their arms out, so it appears like they're not as aggressive. It's sort of more subtle. Right, right. So it could be that subtle distinction is a lot of so that, yeah, that could be. And so, I mean, all the behaviors, it's interesting because they're all, we were coding all of them because I thought they'd all be related to pride. But you're right, there might be that these specific ones versus these ones. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting idea, actually. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, um, you know, to what extent it needs to be sort of contextualized in terms of small group face to face interactions over repeated games of this to actually discriminate huh. between uh, the people that are exhibiting true pride and those who are exhibiting. Interesting question: how, how many observations of an individual expressing pride you need to actually discriminate accurately? Right, that's interesting, huh? Uh, so this over has been time, done, you know, experiments as opposed to sort of thinking ethnographically. Right. So over time, you think that people would be able to make a distinction if you repeat interactions with the same person, kind of thing? Yeah, and then we probably discriminate between you know, bullshitters and uh, right. you know, people who are right. bluffing and that kind of thing. Truly expressing pride. If that's yeah. The right way. Yeah, 
that's an interesting idea. Just, just one more thing. I mean, if it is a true social signal, if it leads to social status in some ways, then, uh, and in both cases, it would lead to higher social status, whether it's true or not, true or not right. true, then it doesn't matter. Because it will be always, a strategy will always work, and it will always be reproduced and brought into the next generation, no matter what. It doesn't matter if people. It doesn't matter whether, it, whether you recognize the relativistic or not. If it leads to social status, also the social status, then in that regard, it has a high fitness. Right, but then it might not be a reliable signal of no, success. No, it might not be a reliable <laughs> signal at all. Right. Okay. That would be fine. Okay. <laughs> Just uh, I, this question I've always had about uh, self-conscious and social emotions, so it applies to pride, but it also probably applies to uh, shame and guilt, etc. Um, shouldn't the evolutionary argument predict that the signal should be stronger when there is an audience, and in particular even stronger when the audience is in an evaluative context where there is an opportunity to establish uh, reputation? And if, if, if you agree with that prediction, is there any evidence for that? Um. I would say I agree with a qualification, which is that you have the presence of an audience increasing both probably the experience of the emotion, sort of, you know, it's easier to think about how good I feel about myself when I'm also able to think about how good everyone else feels about me. So that's sort of enhancing the experience. And I think what you were suggesting, which is that there's more value to showing it if other people are there, I, I benefit more. But the qualification is that in a lot of situations, I'm actually going to be hurt by showing it. Right? Because other people, in certain cultures, it's not at all appropriate to show pride. And so you totally have to tamp it, tamp it down quite a bit in order to show it at a subtle enough level to make it sort of acceptable where it doesn't come off as bragging. So you have kind of, I think, depending on culture and situation, you've got these competing needs. And I think it's probably a balancing act in most cases. The people who are really kind of socially adept at this know exactly the right level to, to regulate and the right level to, to express, basically. And yeah, I think it's the same with shame, exactly, probably at different levels. Yeah. But it, okay, but if we look at the opposite uh, side of the coin, so um, should people feel pride in isolation? If you're, on, you're the only person yes. and nobody's looking at you, yes. does, it, does it make sense for evolution to, to right. you know, program a, a behavior that doesn't have any you know, right. functional... You know, well, I would say it does have a function, right? Because remember the other side of the figure, you're still experiencing it. It's still important for me to feel good about myself. That's going to boost my self-esteem and it's going to motivate me to keep achieving. Um, it's going to motivate me to see myself in a different way. Right? I mean, it's, I think it's, this, is, this is a debate that actually I've had with Mark Leary because he would argue you need other people, right? And, he, and then he says, sometimes he says, well, it's okay. You just can imagine other people responding to your success and then you'll feel pride or, or shame. But I mean, then I think you're saying that you get your paper accepted. Do you really not feel any pride until you think, Ted's going to be so proud of me. <laughs> you know, like I don't buy that. I think you feel more pride when you think about how Ted's going to feel. But you do, I mean, I, I think the reason is because I think it starts in early childhood, right? I think below the age of three or so, it's all about what the parents think. There's no, there's no pride or shame, really. And then the transition is we become socialized so that eventually, you know, when we spill milk, we don't just feel upset because our parents yell at us, but we feel upset because, oh, that means I'm a clumsy idiot. And that's like internalization of, of other representations into the self, and that's how we build a self-concept. And that by the time we're adults, it's so well built and adaptive, we don't need anyone else to tell us how to feel about ourselves. We're very good at making, having our own identity and, and having emotional responses to it. Right, but I would say, I don't think you need to say it's the other. I think it's part of the other is part of myself. So is it possible that uh, these pride displays are simply attracting attention to yourself? Uh, so this, uh, this idea that anyone can display pride, and if the link is just displaying pride, social status, it's a problem. But if you display pride and you draw attention to yourself and you're either not dominant or you have no, no services, no kind of prestige to offer, it might actually be kind of costly to do that. That's interesting. Yeah, no, I, I, that's actually really interesting. And I think someone asked me uh, at a talk once, you know, how, how does your theory fit with Zahavi? So Javi's argument about the handicap principle, and I do think it fits quite well with that, which I think is kind of what you're getting at, that it is, it's a risky display, because you are opening yourself up, you're drawing attention. If you don't have something to back it up, you're kind of in trouble. So yeah, I mean, that sort of works. I don't know if that's enough to demonstrate reliability, but to me, that makes sense. Mark, you want to talk? Yeah, I guess it was just going back to this business of the uh, uh, 
the, the linkage between the signal and the, the quality that's being signaled. Mm -hmm. And just, I mean, if, if we, even if we were just had a, a situation where there was only one sort of pride, right? Wouldn't the pressure be for uh, any form of success to be, to have essentially the same um, output in terms of behaviour? If if that then has an impact in terms of, of status, yeah. so you know finding a uh, you know a twenty five cent piece on the floor. Oh, I see. You're saying why should be, it be interns? exactly the same? Why why would we have any distinction between that sort of success? Right, because that tells nothing about my future ability yeah, but, but, to do anything. But as far as the, uh, the the person who's perceiving the signal is concerned, right? You know, there's a there's a perceived you know, perception part here as well. Right. I mean, all, all they can perceive is that you've been successful and your behavior is exhibiting signs that you've been successful. Right. So, you know, the, but the background of that is the, you know, the reasons why you've been successful. Which should... So why is there no discrimination? Why is there I discrimination? I think there is discrimination. I mean, because I think that situation, I don't know, I mean, if you, I assume you're, you're saying luck versus actual ability or, or well, effort. Well, no, uh, even, even if it is ability-based, oh. but, you know, you could have, you know, things that are pretty trivial. Oh, so still, you're saying whether still result okay. Success now I see what you're saying. You're saying happen. why you know pride should only come from things that are, or the expression should only status should only be given when there's a particularly difficult success. Is that yeah. Whereas we, you'd think if you well, think of it through, I mean, the pressure should be to exhibit pride in all sorts of circumstances, and, and right. for, for there to be very little variation in terms of pride expression. Right. So, okay. So I think and I think what you're getting at here is. The distinction, like, why would it not be adaptive? Is the same question? Why is it, wouldn't it be adaptive for people to show this expression, no matter what kind of success they have, even if it's not really something that deserves high status? Is that so? I guess my answer would be, I think, um, right. I mean, it does seem on the signal side of things that would be adaptive, except if people. I mean, I think you know the long-term outcomes of this stuff. People come to expect more of you, and you're actually kind of an idiot, right? I mean, prestige and dominance come with certain expectations which if you can't live up to, I mean, I think that's the handicapping part of it. So I think the solution to that is we don't feel pride when we do things that aren't particularly impressive. I mean, we don't. We only feel pride when we do things that reach a certain self-defined threshold, I think, of, you know, excitingness, importance, whatever. And those, those are the things that we're then going to show the signal for, and those are the things that we deserve status for. So, so but that's placed in this context of these iterative face-to-face interactions, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. So there's actually speaking to that question, there's some work done by Cameron Anderson in which he shows that um, uh, in groups where people interact over repeated interactions, people who overclaim their status are punished by others. So when you actually want to fake or when people eventually figure out you don't deserve all that pride you're feeling, it would be costly in that sense. And so it would make sense to not overclaim it or shoot fake. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think that is, it is handicapping. I mean, and there's other research showing that narcissists aren't, they're well liked at first, but over time, when people get to know them and realize, you know, they're kind of full of it, they're, they're hated, they're disliked, so. I was wondering if there's any evidence that people learn uh, to not be proud in this hubristic way after experiences or reflection or whatever. Like, do, do narcissists change? Is that the question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. I think that, uh, you know, at the trait level, I, I know that these things are pretty stable, and narcissism is actually one of the hardest things for therapists to cure. Okay. Um, well, but do these people realize that they are narcissistic, or that they're perceived, that it hurts them? Uh, that's another tough question. Often, no. Uh, narcissists tend to lack self-insight, but of course not always. This goes back to, I guess, the, the question that Mark asked very, very early on, and it's sort of in the context of some of the things that are being asked right now, and that is around um, if this is, is a, a way of increasing status and, and success by demonstrations of pride, then it would imply that there's also cheater detection mechanisms that people develop. And I'm just wondering whether or not that you know of any work that's being looked at at 
what, what is the procedure that we use if we are now, as you have demonstrated, we can recognize prideful displays, right. whether it's, it doesn't, I don't think dominance, whether it's dominance or the other kind of pride would matter because dominance displays are tested all the time to see whether or not the person that's displaying or the organism that's displaying in fact has the backup right. to be dominant. Absolutely. Right? Right. So is, do you know work that's, that's uh, around uh, prideful displays of that we would use to detect cheaters? So what kind of what are, what's the mechanism that we use? Is that the question? Like how well, do we? Well, yeah. What is the mechanism? What does it mean? What are the means that we use to find out whether or not the person who is displaying pride right. and therefore claiming increased status right. is actually deserving of that status? Since they're a competitor. Yeah, always. I mean, I don't know that there is any other than I mean, what, what like the evidence that Joey was saying, where it's just more knowledge, more more repeated interactions, you come to see the person doesn't deserve the status they were trying to claim. But other than that, I don't know if there's, I mean, that's just repeated associations, more, you know, more information, essentially. Because it would seem to be a very fruitful area for research. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. That's a great, great idea. Yeah.